OK, so everybody, you're very, very welcome to this latest GPS webinar. Today we're looking at something called the importance of the theoretical framework in your PhD. And indeed, if you were to ask me about when I began my own PhD, about what was one of the most difficult issues to get my head around or to grasp with was, was indeed the theoretical framework. And it's an area in which many people doing a PhD struggle, particularly in the initial stages, because it's not something that we're used to doing or used to uh confronting when when uh in in other areas of our uh, academic life so far so the theoretical framework is something you know which um is intrinsic to to most phds as uh, something it's something which um if you like you know that you you have to um navigate because it provides a framework or a structure um to your research when you're looking at a particular research problem you know because the theoretical framework what it will do you know it, it defines all those key concepts that you have in the research proposes if you like connections or relationships between the, between those key concepts and it discusses if you like the um relevant theories based on a literature review so if we can think of the um a theoretical framework as something that comes out of or, or is indeed uh, something which emanates from the um, literature review that might help us then in terms of how we think about, you know, um, constructing a, a theoretical framework. As I say, it is an area that people do struggle with and it's always a good idea in a case like this to talk about this with your um, supervisor because um, your supervisor will provide a lot of guidance for you in this uh, in, in this particular area. So just because we're looking at theoretical framework, obviously we need to look at well, what's you know, what what's theory? What does theory actually mean? And theory is a word. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very old word looking at uh, from um, a Greek word originally a uh, theoria meaning um, contemplation. It can also mean perspective um, or perception or things that are looked at and are, that are observed. And uh, in um, uh, late Latin or the use of the word theoria uh, meant usually um, a conception or a mental scheme that, that one could use um, uh, for uh, perspective or indeed as a, as a lens through which to observe um, a problem and to make predictions based upon your observation of that problem or that phenomenon. So theories we can say are used to uh, explain phenomena. They're used to draw connections or if you like to, to, to make relationships um, between various um, various concepts or various phenomena. And as I said, they're used then to make uh, predictions uh, or indeed sometimes we can say to make generalizations uh, based on the um, observation of specific phenomena. Um, now, what's interesting is about uh, what I, I found, uh, what I found particularly interesting is how theory can be used um, to assess particular problems or indeed that theory can be derived from looking at particular problems. For example, and I, I, I find this to be a really, really interesting one. The, this is something called the um, Konigsberg Bridge problem. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the city of um, Konigsberg, um, which is now known as the Russian city of um, Kalinin, Kal, um, Kaliningrad. Um, which is located, I think, between Poland and modern day Russia. Um, it uh, that um, uh, uh, I, sorry, it's between Poland and I think is it between Lithuania and Estonia? I think I, I must find out exactly where it's located. It used to be an, a, a city in East Prussia called Konigsberg, and it was the home city of the uh, philosopher uh, Immanuel Kant, and indeed there's a there's a whole street there known as the Philosopher's Way, which is where Immanuel Kant used to go for his daily walks. But Konigsberg had um, uh, seven bridges, used to have seven bridges, no longer has all of those seven bridges. Uh, two of them were bombed by the um, 
uh, air force of the Soviet Union in the Second World War. And when the city of Konigsberg became Russian after the Second World War, um, some of the other bridges, two of the other bridges were dismantled. But before that, um, it had seven bridges. Just to give you an idea of what it is, of, of what they what it what they looked like. This was the problem which many people assessed. This is the the, the seven bridges over the river um, uh, the, the river Pelger in or the river Pregel in um, Konigsberg or in modern day Kaliningrad drew drove people demented. It drove people absolutely insane because what they were trying to solve was a riddle or a puzzle, which was how was it possible to walk over the seven bridges of Konigsberg without crossing any of the bridges twice? And uh, this led, would you believe that this riddle or this problem led um, uh, a, a huge number of people to assess the issue and it led um, a, a genius of a mathematician called Leonard Euler to invent something called graph theory, which we can also refer to as a network theory. So this problem, uh, which was assessed, you know, for centuries by various philosophers and by various mathematicians and scholars, ultimately the answer was that the seven bridges could not be crossed. But it did lead to this new form of theory, as I say, graph theory or network theory. It actually, the Konigsberg Bridge problem changed the face of modern mathematics because of the invention of graph theory. There's a huge amount there about edges and nodes and networks, which I'm not going to get into now, but very, very interesting material to it to examine about how this particular problem, the Konigsberg Bridge problem, led to develop to the development of uh, new theory in uh, in in the field of mathematics. And as I say, helped to transform the whole area of mathematics in a way which was not um, uh, thought of or um, before um, this event. So. Very, very interesting how theory can lead to uh, new how how sorry how problems which are examined can lead to new theory and theory which in fact changes the face of a particular discipline, as the Konigsberg Bridge problem did with the face of modern mathematics. Okay, so just to give you some that, that just a little bit of background there about theory. So let's look at theoretical framework and you know the theoretical framework and what it is and why it's important. And as I say, you know, a lot of people struggle with the theoretical framework in their in their PhD. It can be, you know, one of those areas in which people can become um, uh, entangled in uh, in a way which they the other areas of their PhD are um, in which they don't become so embroiled or entangled in in other areas of their PhD. So we can refer to the theoretical framework as your blueprint or your guide for your research. As I said, you know, um, basically it provides a structure or as um, a really, really interesting site called PhD Proofreaders. And I would recommend that you look at their um, assessment or their their analysis of the theoretical framework and that particular site, PhD proofreaders, because it's really excellent uh, just in terms of um, the insight it gives into what a theoretical framework actually is. You know, what, um, uh, why, why we use a theoretical framework, why it's so important, um, what, um, why we use um, theories, how the theoretical framework helps us to explain um, theories that support your research, you know, and show that your work is grounded already in established ideas. So really, really useful um, material there on PhD proofreaders about the theoretical framework. But it says there that the theoretical framework is like a toolbox. So if you can imagine a toolbox, you know, like um, containing things that you need to fix a problem, you know, like a maintenance problem in your house. So if you think of, you know, you need to hang something and you're using, you know, a screwdriver, a hammer, a nail, etc. Think of what you're using. So the, the theoretical framework, if you like, is the, is the toolbox. It contains the tools that you need to fix a particular problem. And that's a, that's actually a really useful analogy, as we see here, because 
Um, as it says in PhD proofreaders, in your literature review, you highlight the problem that needs fixing. So that's, you know, in the literature review, you know, what do you do? You assess the literature that's in the area. You see or you identify a gap in the knowledge or in the literature. And this is a gap which your research is going to address. Doesn't mean that you're going to fix the gap or that you're going to, you know, you're going to solve the conundrum or the problem, but it means that you're going to try and address that particular gap uh, that you see in the knowledge or in the literature. So that is the problem that needs fixing. OK, so um, so with a problem that needs fixing, the, the, the toolbox contains the tools that you will need. And what are those tools? There are things like theories, concepts, hypotheses, propositions, those are the tools within the toolbox that you will use to fix that problem or to address that gap or to make sense of that problem or to, or to try and, if you like, solve that particular uh, contradiction or that gap that you see in the knowledge or in the literature. So that's a really, really useful metaphor uh, for a theoretical framework. That it's, it's like it's like a toolbox because, you know, you have uh, a problem the problem needs to be fixed. You need particular tools to, to, to fix the problem. Where do you store the tools? The tools are in the, 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 the toolbox. And within that toolbox, it, 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 it's, um, that is, if you like, um, where you keep the tools. What these, the tools, what the theoretical framework should do, the chapter, what it should do with regard to, um the um, particular uh, tools that you're using, be it the theories, concepts, hypotheses and propositions, they will discuss in details what those theories, hypotheses, concepts and propositions look like, how they behave, how they have been used before, how they relate or how they connect to one another, how they are relevant to the goals of your research and what the limitations or the drawbacks are from using those particular tools. So the, the, the methods chapter, then you can say you're, when it comes to your methods or looking at your, um, your methodology, your methods chapter will discuss then how you, and I, I hate this word, um, operationalize, and excuse me, just while I wrench while using that term, but it, it will discuss, so your methods chapter will discuss then how you use those particular tools. Um, but in your theoretical framework, you will discuss, you know, what those tools are. So what those theories are, what those concepts, you know, propositions um, uh, and concepts are. So when it comes to the theoretical framework, you know, I would say a good thing to do um, is to do a kind of a counterfactual exercise and to look at, well, what would your research be like if you didn't have a theoretical framework if you, you know if your house didn't have a foundational structure basically is what you're is what you're asking there so take a moment i would say just to contemplate your own area of research and your own um research question and uh just think about you know what your research would like if would look like if you didn't have a theoretical framework in place. You know, if you didn't have um, uh, something which would define the the key concepts in your research, um, which would you know propose connections and relationships between them, and um, um, which would you know discuss the um, relevant theories based on a literature review. But what's also important, I guess, about a, theor a theoretical framework is a theoretical framework is basically, as I say, it's a framework, it's a structure, it's a foundation. A lot of people also use the meta, as I say, it's like a, like a toolbox, but some people also use the metaphor of a, a roadmap and it's something that will guide your research. So it gives your research a particular direction, which allows you then to interpret, uh, to explain and, as I say, to generalize from your findings. So just, you know, um, think about your own research and just if it didn't have a theoretical framework, if it didn't have a particular 
uh, roadmap to guide it and to give it direction. What what would it look like? And you could say then that that would lead to a certain form of chaos, a certain form of anarchy within your research project because it would then become very unwieldy, very difficult to actually manage at the direction in which your research project is going. Um, and another question which I'd like you to uh, contemplate also is how many potential explanations are there to answer your research question? Because this can be, you know, we can um, uh, look at a research topic and we can approach it, um, you know, differently we, with a different theoretical framework. And I think that the, the site, um, it's called Scribber, looks at this in a very, very interesting way because it looks, for example, at things like um, how, for example, in say in literature, how if one um, uses uh, something like modernist or postmodernist literary theory to examine something like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby, um, compared to using Marxist literary theory, how the uh, interpretation of the book would look very, very different. Or say, for example, in, in economics, how wealth inequalities, how one, one would assess or try to explain or in, to interpret uh, inequalities in wealth. Um, if, if we examine them with um, a Keynesian framework or with a classical uh, economics framework, how those or that issue of inequality would look very, very different, could look very differently. How our, how our interpretation of wealth inequality could look very, very differently. And similarly, I think the example is given also from psychology about how um, um, th there are different methods and assumptions when it comes to, say, for example, um, that are used, for example, in a behaviorist um, approach to depression compared, for example, to a psychoanalytical approach. So you, you can interpret the same issue or the same concept in a very different way by looking at it through a different theoretical lens. So I guess, you know, in your own research questions, it's also, you know, it's a good idea to look at, well, what are the alternative ways of looking at this particular research question? So uh, you can come up with, I guess, all kinds of different um, ideas on that. But I think it's 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 worth considering, you know, that you, there's not just one way to look at a particular problem. And those examples which are given, you know, about looking at a, at a, at, at, um, a work of literature, through a postmodernist literary theory perspective rather than through a Marxist literary perspective certainly would be very, very illuminating and it would be very, very interesting to see um, a work of literature approach from one perspective compared to the other and how that work is interpreted differently, what the differences are in interpretation from looking at it through a postmodernist literary perspective compared to a Marxist literary perspective, for example, or as I say, looking at wealth equality from a, a Keynesian approach compared to a classical uh, economics approach, or indeed looking at the whole area of, of depression, as I said, from uh, adopting a behaviorist approach compared to a psychoanalytical approach. So all of those things are very, very well worth contemplating. So think about, you know, how many potential explanations are there to answer your own research question? OK, so when we use um, theory, what, what are we doing? We're focusing on a small subset of all the potential explanations they are that are there and focusing, if you like, on one particular viewpoint. So as I say, you know, um, we can use, you know, di um, uh, uh, we or we the, the, we can use different approaches to the same research topic. So we use theory. You know what we're doing is you know we're focusing our attention on one particular viewpoint. So theory we can say is is like a lens uh, that you apply, if you like, to make sense of the world that you use. You know to 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 uh, interpret the world and to make predictions about certain phenomena. So that, if you like, 
to go back to PhD proofreaders, that's what they refer to as the shape of the toolbox that you're using. Um, so th um, the theory is, if you like, you know, it's it's your perspective on the world. So without a theoretical framework, without a roadmap, if you like, without a foundation, without this this toolbox, we're left with what is potentially a, a conflicting and just a great morass, a great number of of um, particular viewpoints on a, a research problem. And that could make our whole data collection and our data analysis and our discussions and our findings really chaotic, because if we're not looking at it through a particular lens, uh, what are we left with? We're left purely then with um, with with description and not without analysis. So we are, if you like, so so the, the, the theoretical framework really, really helps to guide our research down a particular path. Um, and that's, you know, another reason why it is so, so important. So what does it do, the theoretical framework? It defines key concepts in your research. It will propose key connections or we will almost interpret or find key connections but between those concepts and um, and it discusses then you discuss relevant theories based upon your literature review or based upon that problem that you have identified in the literature review and how you go about addressing that gap in the literature or the or in knowledge in the knowledge that you have identified in the literature review. So a strong theoretical framework, what it can do is it can give your research direction. So it's like, as I say, like a roadmap. It allows you to interpret, to explain and to generalize from your findings. So as I say, so you can make generalizable propositions based upon your observation of specific phenomena. So that's why, you know, theoretical framework is, is so, so useful. It's like, as I say, it's like, it's like a lens to interpret the world in a particular way, to interpret and explain the world in a particular way. So when it comes to preparing a, a theoretical framework, um, what I would say here is this is something which is really, really important to discuss with your supervisor. Um, but th I'm just providing you here with some guidelines, if you like, or some basis for what you can do or, it, or, or some basis for helping you to approach this particular area of your PhD. Because I said it is an area where a lot of people struggle, particularly in the initial stages with their theoretical framework. Because this is, if you like, this theoretical framework is another kind of example of um, um, uh, uncert of a, the kind of uncertainty that so many PhD students uh, undergo when they are uh, engaged in things like, you know, the conceptualization stage or the proposal stage, or indeed, you know, um, when they are making a new leap into an area which is relatively unknown, because I'd say if I did a, um, it would be interesting to hear from you in the breakout rooms about what your experience of um, creating a theoretical framework was um, before doing your PhD. So I think, um, um, as I say, a lot of people struggle with this because it's a new area. Sometimes it can be very, very um, uh, nebulous, be very, very hard to um uh, to make that big leap uh, into an area where you know you're 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 putting your um research problem into a particular context you know as, as I, I mentioned before about the literature review for many people a literature review you never undertake a literature review as extensive as you do really with um as, as you do in in your phd and your literature review and you and you you can see with your literature view, you know, what the problem is, what problem is that you are going to solve or going to try and address. So um, for many, many people struggle with this concept and then the theoretical framework is, is building on the literature view. So if people are struggling with the literature review, 
it's almost inevitable that they're going to struggle with the theoretical framework and people do struggle with the literature review, you know, undoubtedly. And uh, and that could be, you know, one of the main reasons why people do struggle then with the with the theoretical framework. But we'll just look at what a problem statement does, first of all, or just about, you know, building a um, um, a, um a, a theoretical framework because I would say the basis for preparing a th theoretical framework would be three three pronged. It would have a problem statement, it would have the research questions or your research question and the literature review. So uh, let's look at each of those in turn. So let's look, for example, at the problem statement and what is it about the, the problem statement that we're trying to do? So if you think of a research problem, you know, and that could be what we talked about earlier, you know, that gap in the knowledge or in the literature that you will address some issue which you see that needs to be addressed, uh, uh, some some difficulty, some contradiction, some um, gap which you think um, you can address. And this becomes the basis then, if you like, for your research question. So. That's your research problem. So you have the, the, the problem. So what's your problem statement then? Well, your problem statement is something which should, first of all, put that particular problem in context. That's the first thing that a problem statement should do. So what is the problem that you're addressing? So it puts it into the context of the literature in the field already and in the knowledge that is already in the in, in the public domain. It should you should then, if you like, and describe the specific issue that you are going to address. So you describe what that issue is and how you and 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 um, and 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 what it is that you you will uh, assess and address in your research. Then what you do is you demonstrate the relevance of the of of the problem and show here exactly you know why it's important that this particular issue is addressed and then you set the objectives of the research now you don't need to follow this in any way but all i'm doing is providing you here with some guidance into what you know a theoretical framework uh, can do so hopefully it's not getting too complex or you're not feeling too intimidated by this all i'm doing is just giving you uh, one way of looking at a um, at a theoretical framework but hopefully this uh, will will help you in some way uh, when it comes to doing your own uh, theoretical framework uh, in your PhD. So just to um, reassess there once again that the, the theoretical framework it should you know in in the theoretical framework what you should do really is explain the theories that support your research and it allows you then to show that your work is grounded in ideas which have already been established. So, so you know that what it, what this means is you can show, you can demonstrate that your work is is supported or it's embedded or grounded within ideas which are already within the the, the public domain. So, uh, before you begin your research, um, you have to look and examine. And to see well what areas what theories what models have already been developed in my area so you assess those you look at those you observe those in in a sense you analyze those as well and you will have done this for example you know in your uh, uh in in your literature review for the most part so the goal of a theoretical framework i would say is to present and to explain what theories and what models have already been developed. So, um, uh, and the extent to which one does this uh, can can differ from uh, from discipline to discipline. But um, the uh, idea here is to use, if you like, theories that are are already and um, that have already been developed um, as as a way to um, uh, give you, as I say, you know, your theoretical framework, what it should do is it gives your research direction and it will allow you then to interpret 
and to explain and to generalize from from your findings. So um, it really will help you the uh, theoretical framework, you know, to present and to explain what theories, what models have already been developed, not not be not for its own sake, but what you are trying to do then is to, is to to you will use those theories then to support um, your work, to support the basis of your work and show by doing so, then you will show that your work is 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 um, is solid, that it is embedded in ideas and in theories that are already um, and, and models that are already in the public domain. So um, it's a way of giving, if you like, credibility to your research. So a, a theoretical framework, you know, when you're looking at all these um, theories and theoretical models, what it involves is evaluating. Um, it involves comparing and selecting the most relevant theories and the most relevant theoretical models um, for use in your own research. You know, what are the most relevant ones? You know, by examining those various theories and models, you think what's what are the most relevant theories and models for my research? So um, by framing your research within a clearly defined field, and as I said, you know, it could be, say, within literature that you're looking at postmodern, um, post, uh, you're, you're taking postmodern literary theory, or you could be looking, for example, at Marxist literary theory, or if you're a, in economics, you could be looking at something from a Keynesian perspective or from a classical economist perspective or indeed in psychology. You may be taking a behaviorist approach compared to a, a psychoanalytical approach. So by framing your own research within a clearly defined field, you make the reader of your research aware of the assumptions that inform your approach and you show the rationale behind the choices that you have made. So. Um, uh, the framework or theoretical framework, what it should do then is lay the foundations to support your analysis. Say so you can think of it as like a foundational structure which will support your analysis. It will help you to interpret your results and from that towards the end of your PhD to make broader generalizations uh, based on your analysis and your interpretation of your results. So um, th that is why, you know, the uh, theoretical framework, you know, is so important. It's it as, a, it as I say, it's like a roadmap, it's like a guide, but it provides structure to your PhD as well. So um, as I said before, you know, the same research topic can be approached differently with different theoretical frameworks. And I gave those examples that we have seen from literature, uh, from economics, and from uh, the, the, the way that one looks at the issue of depression, for example, from either a behaviorist approach or a psychoanalytical approach. So all of those things are, you know, very, very um, worthy ways of looking at particular issues. You know, we can use a Keynesian lens to look at wealth inequality or a classical economics lens to look at it, uh, to look at the issue of wealth inequality. So all of these are, if you like, established theories or credible theories for examining a particular phenomena, phenomenon or a, a particular issue, um, a particular concept. So they're all credible um, uh, theories. So what we are doing by, by you know, in our theoretical framework is showing that our own ideas are grounded in credible theories and in work which has already been, if you like, um, verified as credible within the public domain. OK, so um, yeah, this will this will be something which I'm going to ask you to do in the breakout rooms later to assess, you know, if your own um, work was being looked at with with a different theoretical lens or through a different um, theoretical framework, um, how might it look? This is something which we'll examine later on, as I say, in, in the breakout rooms. But just think for a moment of how using a different theory, a different approach or a different framework to analyze, to interpret and to explain certain phenomena in your own research 
could potentially lead to a different outcome. So say, for example, you know, you're looking at a particular issue with a di through a different theoretical lens. How might that issue actually look? So that's what I'm asking you to do there, something which we'll uh, look at in much more detail and in much greater depth in the breakout rooms shortly. OK, so <clears throat> about creating a theoretical framework and here we're looking at things like, you know, identifying the key concepts in your research um, evaluating and explaining um, relevant theories uh, and demonstrating how your research fits in. Um, uh, you know how you, how your project makes use of these theories. So just let's let's look at this quickly. So first of all, you identify the key concepts. So you clearly define what you mean by each term in your um, in in your problem statement and in your research questions, you evaluate and you explain uh, relevant theories. For example, that you've come across in your um, literature review, and you demonstrate how your research fits in and how it will make use of those theories. So, uh, and and also what it will do. Um, it will it will make sure, for example, that your theory has credibility, that it can um, that when it's tested, that it holds its relevance in a particular context. Um, and also, you know, we use theory um, as a basis for uh, interpreting our results and also, as I say, for a way of um, making generalizations about specific um, pheno uh, uh, phenomena, but also um, we can use um, and something I'll look at shortly is we can look also here at combining uh, theories or different theories in a, in in a particular way um, uh, and uh, we can also use the theoretical framework to develop hypotheses for your own research as well. So there's a lot that we can do when we're creating um, a theoretical framework, but I'd say um, for now we can look at it from these this particular way. First of all, identify the key concepts, identify or clearly define what you mean by each term in what might call your, in your problem statement and in your research questions. Evaluate and explain um, the relevant theories that you've come across and for example that you've come across in your literature review and demonstrate how your research fits in, why it's suitable and how it will make use of these theories. So again, you can clearly see why people can struggle with this uh, when doing their PhD because it's not that, you know, it's it's, it's not simply um, a, a case of um, um, of of absorbing knowledge here. What you're doing, if you like, is you're um, you're becoming increasingly analytical. But the theoretical framework is a good way, and I, I've said this also about the literature review. It's a really good way of finding your voice as a researcher, um, and and in fact, you know, creating a stronger identity for for yourself as a researcher because you really feel that you are making what we sometimes call that epistemic epistemic shift, you know, from being um, an absorber of knowledge to a creator of knowledge. So that's, you know, the, the, the theoretical framework is really a stage where people do evolve and they grow. And it's, it's a major leap for many people when doing a PhD. So that is, I guess, another reason why, why some people do struggle with the theoretical framework. Uh, I, I should say also that many people love the theoretical framework, love the whole idea of it, love the concept of it, take to it um, magnificently from the outset, but for some people they can find it something of a struggle. Okay, so i just say with regard to the structure of a theoretical framework that there are no, there are no essentially fixed rules with regard to, you know, the structure of a, um, of, of a, of a theoretical framework. One option, one thing you could do is to draw on your research questions and structure each section around a question or a concept. That's one way of looking at it. What well, that's one interesting way, certainly, of looking at it. 
I would say, for example, that when you are um, writing your thesis, something which is very, very important to keep in mind is that your examiners are likely to be familiar with the theory that you're using. So say, for example, you know that you are using something like classical or, or say Keynesian theory in economics, you know, your examiners will be will be familiar with the theory. So they don't need you to say they don't need you to give, you know, a, a long, long, um, you know, 50 page explanation of what that theory is. What they need you to do is to discuss how and why that theory has been adapted uh, and 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 brought into to your own research and how you have interpreted how you have used that theory to frame the context of your own research. So they don't, as I say, they don't want to hear you know twenty pages on you know on on as I say graph theory or network theory or whatever kind of theory it may be, because they'll be familiar with the theory, but they want to see how you have used the theory to address issues in your research. Uh, so that's why I guess, you know, you you don't need, and again, something to discuss with your supervisor, but I would caution against, you know, giving long um, descriptive, um, a long descriptive tre treatise on what the theory is, because the, the examiners will be familiar with the theory. It's important, obviously, to say what the theory is and to discuss it, but um, you really should be more concerned with um, uh, showing how you have used the theory, how you have adapted the theory for your own research and how you know, you've used it to make sense of your own research. Now, what can happen, of course, is that sometimes uh, you look at an issue. You're you're doing your theoretical framework, and you and you're looking at your research question. Um, you're looking at um, your literature review. You're examining, you know, what your research problem. You're looking then at your problem statement. You're trying to put this um, problem into context. Um, you're describing the issue that you'll address. You're showing the relevance of the, of, the, of, the, of the problem that you're trying to address. And you're setting out your objectives. And then you're thinking, oh my, you know, I think I can look at this. You know, I think when I'm trying to explain these various phenomena, um, I think that I can see more than one theory here that I can use. So what do you do when you're looking at something through more than one theoretical lens? Or if you think you're looking, if you think that you will need to look at a problem or address a research question or to address a, a problem, and try to answer trying to answer a research question if you if you're if you're using more than a single theory so that is somewhat problematic for many people you know how do we use more than one theoretical lens to interpret and to analyze um an issue uh, in our research so i think what you what you have to look at here and again this is something which you need to talk about with your with your supervisor, but consider, you know, what are the benefits of focusing on more than one theory? So that's something to 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 to, to take into account first of all. Um, excuse me. Secondly, ask: Does one theory, or does you know, the, does the second theory you're using, does that address? the shortcomings in the other theory? Does that help you to assess or to address the um, the shortcomings that you can find in the other theory? And if so, you know, there's nothing wrong with using more than one theory, but it can just be quite complex and sometimes can cause confusion, and uh, not merely for examiners, but obviously for the, for the person undertaking the research. Think also, you know, are there, what are the limitations? Or indeed, what are the drawbacks to using more than one theory? So, um, 
that's another question to answer or to look at. Sorry, another question to ask. Not that you're going to be able to answer the, the questions necessarily, but just think about maybe what limitations are there or could there be to using more than one theory? And that, as I say, I'm not being facetious. I think that could be a, a question without an answer. Um, Dr. Downs. Yes. Hello? Hi. Uh, thank you um, for taking my question. Would that affect the word count in the PhD? What's common? You know, what's best practice to stay within the word count if we're introducing a second theory, as you say there, and and the concerns of being aware of the limitations and drawbacks, and the confusion maybe would it confuse? My question is the word count of the PhD. What's best practice there now? Yeah, um, it shouldn't really, um, Elizabeth, it shouldn't really have a, a huge impact on the on, on the word count, I would say, you know, um, I, I think, you know, when it comes to um, uh, looking at the PhD towards the end, uh, you know, there are various areas that you'll have to just, you know, edit out or excise um yeah. but before before you submit you know it's recommended the maximum number of words is 100,000 words um which i think includes you know uh, by um bibliography and notes and annotations etc so but but you'll be able to you'll be able to excise the, or to cut out a lot of those um a certain amount from the phd if you feel that you are going above the world limit you'll you'll make choices based on what you see as the most important aspects. And I would say your theoretical framework is one of the most, I would say, uh, for many students, uh, theoretical framework is one of the most important aspects of the PhD, because as I say, it's it's really, it's giving, you know, it's a way of um, of framing, it's your roadmap, it's, it's how you structure, it's showing how you're going to structure the thesis, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 your, as I say, you know, your use of theory is just is so important or how you use that theory, because, as I say, you could end up with a very different um, answer to your research question if you're looking at a problem through a different theoretical lens or by using a different theoretical framework. So, um, and if you're using more than one theory, I don't think that should necessarily affect the word count, you know, necessarily. You know, I, I wouldn't say mm -hmm. so, Elizabeth. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't I, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't think so. You know, I, I don't think it really it really should, you know. Um, yeah, concise but I think, yeah, 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 exactly. But the thing about the good thing about using a theoretical framework is that it will help you with the word count because as, as, as you mentioned there about going off on tangents, if you don't have a structure like that, mm -hmm. you know, and again, this is something that you need to discuss with your supervisor, um, which all of you would need to discuss with your supervisor, but your theoretical framework will give you, it will be your, if you like, it will be like, like your research question is going to guide you in how you interpret a particular problem. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really important to ha to have this, but it stops you then from going off in particular tangents. Because if if you if you, for example, you know, if you don't have a theoretical framework, mm -hmm. you don't have a theoretical lens through which you're looking at a particular problem. You can look at that problem in all kinds of ways, and you can come up with all kinds of interpretations. And that's all laudatory and worthy, but it means that you're going to be full of confusion. You're going to have little direction when it comes to the to the thesis itself, it's not going to help you to answer the research question because you're going to end up with multiple answers and interpretations to a particular issue. And it's just going to create, it's going to create absolute anarchy when it comes yeah, to your own. Yeah, and ambiguity as well, yes. Oh, absolutely, complete, yes, yes utterly. Thank yes, you, Dr. Um, yeah, no problem. For no a fabulous problem. presentation and have a lovely weekend. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll just continue because we're near the end, so we can then go into the breakout rooms after this. But just about so, yes. So think about what the limitations are to using more than one theory. And as I say, there may not be an answer to this. There may be few limitations or few drawbacks that you see to using more than one theory. So um 
but I, I, something else which be and this is again where that um phd proofreader site is really good um think about this question also you know are the theories you're bringing together are they what we might call epistemologically compatible are they um do they work together you know are they really um um it, are, are they or are they so incompatible are they like two um two people with speaking different languages who are you know mutually unintelligible to each other so do the two theories if you like speak to each other do 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 they are they compatible with each other and um, when one theory is used to assess a problem and you're using a second theory you know are they actually do do they complement each other are they compatible with each other for example you know that 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 example was given in scribber or scriber about using say for example you know postmodernist literary theory and marxist literary theory but I, I i wouldn't say that they necessarily are uh, compatible with each other to look at a particular problem or a particular issue or how to interpret a particular work of literature um you'd end up with a really really confusing um perspective or interpretation of a work of literature if you were to use both simultaneously okay so uh, and, and think also have these theories been used together before now if they haven't been used before that doesn't stop you from using them you know and being a pioneer in the, in in your field by using these theories together for the same time you know for the first time so um uh but just think about you know have they been used before have they been used successfully before have you know and and look at the results you know and did the use of the th two theories simultaneously um cause confusion and the the word elizabeth just used there ambiguity among the readers um, it was interesting this week um, uh, um, uh, when I was discussing the whole issue of, of, of research with a colleague who and I was asking, you know, for some guidance for, for postgraduate researchers or what advice that that person would give somebody with a lot of experience of, you know, not only doing a PhD, but obviously, but supervising uh, PhD students. And I asked her, you know, what advice would you give? a uh, postgraduate researcher doing a, 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 a PhD. And she said, well, I, I have two pieces of advice. One would be, first of all, you know, to stay focused on, on your research, you know, and, and this is where, you know, theoretical framework and a research question um, are so useful because they help to guide you in. And as I say, they're like a roadmap on you uh, on your research journey. So stay focused. That's you know, try to remain focused on on your research, and obviously, much easier said than 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 me. Much easier said by by me than actually doing it. So stay focused on your research. But the second thing she said was again very very interesting. I thought she said she said my second piece of advice to postgraduate research students would be uh, be kind to your examiners, and what she meant by that is. Your examiners are the two people who read your thesis. So don't confuse them or don't um, lead them down, you know, the equivalent, the metaphorical or the 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 thesis equivalent of the blind of the of the dark alley. Don't create problems for your examiners i would say because you or don't do anything to annoy or to provoke the wrath of your examiners only because and i say that just because you know your examiners will have a very short amount of time to read your thesis it's almost cruel in a way you have spent years working on this project and the 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 the, the people who read it eventually are your supervisors and your internal and your external examiners but it's not your supervisor who's going to be the judge ultimately of your of your thesis it's going to be two people the internal and the external examiners so i thought that was really good advice just just to be just to be kind to your examiner so if you're 
doing something like, you know, with regard to a theoretical framework and you're using two theories to assess a particular problem, to interpret a, a particular phenomena, but those those two theories are very are mutually incompatible and uh, that they create all kinds of confusion when you use them simultaneously or to, when you use them to look at a particular problem and to interpret a particular problem. Uh, and if you think then, of, well, what would be generalizable from those results, you know, that you're looking at? Um, so I would say, yeah, that's excellent advice. You know, be kind to your examiners. Um, as in, you know, make sure that there's clarity in your PhD, that you avoid ambiguity, that you avoid um, creating a, a problem for the examiners. What I mean by creating a problem for the examiners is um, that, you know, when you when you're using um, a theory, when you're looking at your literature view, when using your research question, you know, do so in a way which is, if you like, um, not going, we, we just make sure you do so in an analytical and in a clear way, and in a way that shows that you're not trying to deceive or you're not trying to take shortcuts or you're not trying to bluff your way through a particular problem. So I thought that was a really good, I thought that was a really good way of, of looking at something, you know, to be kind to your examiners and just not to give them anything that, you know, would provoke them into thinking, well, this person, I don't know this because they're reading your work and it's, you know, the ex external examiner is not really going to know you. So you, what you don't want is for an external examiner to, go, you know, they're not going to know anything about your academic background, really. You put the last thing you want is for the external examiner to go, I think this person is 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 not creating a very convincing argument here, or I think this person is bluffing or so. So I thought, well, that's really good advice. So, you know, just be kind to your examiners. And one way to be kind to your examiners is not to use different theoretical approaches which are not compatible with each other because that creates that could create major problems for you. Again, you know, I would say this is something to discuss with your supervisor. Really, really important to discuss this with your supervisor um, because, you know, I'm just giving you general outlines about theoretical framework and about, you know, um, research skills and working on your PhD. But ultimately, you know, the most important relationship that you have when you're doing a PhD, the most important relationship you have, certainly when it comes to the thesis, is with your supervisor. So again, something that you really need to discuss with your supervisor. But yeah, I think, yeah, really good advice that I heard during the week. Be focused, stay focused and be kind to your examiners. Something else to, to, to you know, if you're using more than one theory, just think, are you prioritizing? Are you giving too much focus to one theory above the other? So that's again, you know, another way of another question that's worth considering if you have and if you're using more than one theory. So um, just before we go to the breakout rooms, I just want to tell you about two very good sources online and I've I've lent on them for this particular discussion because I thought they were really good. Uh, I thought they were just both excellent sources um, for this particular aspect of the um, uh, of, 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 of the webinar, looking at the theoretical framework. One, as I said, is called PhD proofreaders. And I know that there's, you know, PhD proofreaders that somebody offers, you know, one-to-one -one coaching sessions for um, PhD researchers. But um, so the, what I think they try to do here is to get you to look at this particular issue like a theoretical framework. And then if somebody has a big issue with it, you know, that they can have a one on one coaching session with this PhD um, PhD consultant. But I think, you know, I don't think any of you will need that. But it was just um, it was just something I hadn't really seen before. You know, somebody who would consult PhD students on the on their uh, on, on, on their research. Um, I, and it must be a new online phenomenon. Um, which I've, has, has uh, only been 
or, or come to the fore recently again, but it seems to be very, very rare. But that site, PhD Proofreaders, is really good. And for now, it's all public. I assume in some, you know, at some stage, it'll probably go behind a paywall because that's what the primary motivation of the person involved seems to be, I think. Uh, so for now, but for now, that material is up there and the material I thought on the theoretical framework uh, on that site on PhD proofreaders was really excellent. The other uh, site which I leaned on for this uh, discussion today, which I thought was really excellent, was something called uh, Scriber or Scriber. Um, uh, very, very good site um, with a lot of material, huge number of resources that are so, so useful uh, and lots of nice um explanatory videos also like, like like lots of nice little capsule videos of three or four minutes which give a really really good explanation for um various things like you know differences between method and methodology you know doing a literature review writing a research question doing a theoretical framework etc the the difference between theoretical framework and conceptual framework so all the things that you need to know about um uh, with regard to a PhD or doing a PhD, you can find them online. And that's a great bonus, a great thing to have while undertaking your own research. So 